we've got about 950 million tons of ore. Um, so a giant deposit, uh, it looks like it will produce, uh, in a typical year, it will produce 35,000 tons of nickel. Hello and welcome to the Assay TV Wednesday. I'm delighted to be joined once again by Mark Jarvis, who is the CEO and Chairman of Giga Metals Corporation. The company's core asset is their Turn Again project located in northern British Columbia, which contains one of the few significant undeveloped sulfide, nickel and cobalt resources in the world. Okay, so welcome, Mark. Great to have you back on the Assay here with us today. Well, it's very nice to see you, Katie. Okay, so it's been a little while since we last caught up. So can you just give our viewers a bit of a rem reminder of Giga Metals and obviously your joint venture with Mitsubishi, please? Well, um, yeah, Mitsubishi uh, started with us about a year ago, I guess, and, and uh, they wanted to set up a joint venture company, which we did. Um, we created a wholly owned subsidiary and then uh, Mitsubishi bought 15% of it by putting money in and we've spent uh, not all that money, but a lot of that money um, doing our pre-feasibility study, which we just announced last week. It's still not filed on CDAR. It's probably another two or three weeks away from that. Okay. But we announced all of the material information last week. Mitsubishi is delighted with it. Well, let's get into the numbers then. Do you have any highlights for us for that pre-feasibility study? Well, we've got... Uh, a reserve for the first time. We've got about 950 million tons of ore. Um, so a giant deposit. Uh, it looks like it will produce, uh, in a typical year, it'll produce 35,000 tons of nickel and 2,000 tons of cobalt uh, in a very nice, clean concentrate. That's 18% uh, nickel, 1.1% cobalt. So it's a beautiful premium product. Um, the uh, project has been significantly de-risked, so that was that was really the goal of this is to is to describe the project as accurately as we could uh, using a very conservative engineering firm, um, and then in terms of the capital cost, one point nine billion dollars U.S. Uh, you know, uh, Tetra Tech went and actually got quotes, so. So, uh, you know, very, very skinny error bars around the uh, potential CapEx. And just to put that in context, uh, you know, uh, these uh, HPAL projects uh, that are happening in Indonesia, uh, you know, the ones of a similar scale, you know, 35,000 tons a year of nickel, uh, their CapEx is about uh, $3 billion. Um, so, so we are competitive with those. Um, and again, I just, it's a beautiful product that we make. Uh, any We model selling it to a smelter, but it could also go through, through a pressure oxidation circuit uh, and directly into the cathode supply chain. Excellent. So in terms of near-term progression, where are we now? What's the next steps? Next step is to find the next partner. Um, yeah. Where we are right now, uh, from here to a final investment decision. So full uh, feasibility engineering uh, through the environmental assessment process um, and to permits, uh, we think, or I think it's going to cost about 50 million US dollars. So it's significant money for a small company. Um, and we're not uh, planning to do any financing at the corporate level. We're looking to do our financing by having people buy into the project itself. Excellent. And let's look at a bit of a broader picture. You mentioned, again, the environmental licenses, etc. What is it like operating in Northern British Columbia as a jurisdiction? Well, Canada and uh, British Columbia are, are mining jurisdictions. You can, yeah. get, uh, you, you can get projects built. Um, I won't say it's easy. Um, yeah. You know, Canada and mm -hmm. British Columbia have very high environmental standards. Um, they've also adopted UNDRIP. United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Yeah. Um, and that has, uh, you know, an impact as well. Um, 
However, we're fortunate in that uh, where we are, we're dealing with uh, you know a couple of First Nations, the Taltan and the Casca, that are generally in favor of economic development. They want to see that it's responsibly done, but um, you know they're 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 good business people, frankly. And so uh, you know it, it's you know it's not like you know they're opposed to everything. They're not. So, you know, we do have to demonstrate that we're being good environmental stewards in developing this project, but, uh, you know, we can do that. I think this project lends itself to that. Absolutely. And in terms of nickel supply, um, it's estimated around 250 to 450,000 tonnes per annum are needed just for um, battery projects in North America alone. Um, how do we see that playing out? Do you think there'll be a deficit in years to come? Yeah, there's not enough nickel for that. Yeah. And and so that's why I mean when 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 we look we used uh, nine dollars and seventy five cents a pound as our base case price for the study. Mm-hmm. That is nineteen percent below the average price of nickel uh, for the last twenty years in twenty twenty three dollars. And then of course you know as we're preparing to put this out the price of nickel you know declined and uh, um, you know China's been slowing down as I'm sure you're aware. Um, although I'm starting to see uh, signs of life in China again. Um, but whenever China slows down, you know, those of us in the commodities business, you know, brace ourselves because things slow down in the business temporarily. I see it as a road bump um, or pardon me, as a speed bump. So, you know, uh, you know, the current price, frankly, doesn't matter to us that much because we're not producing nickel right now. The price five years out, 10 years out, 20 years out, that's what matters to us. And if you look at the growth of electric vehicles alone and add it to the growth in stainless steel, which is traditionally the biggest use of nickel, that that, that hasn't gone anywhere either. Um, it's just there's a lot of nickel needed. And for the battery business, it's class one nickel. It's nickel in a certain form, a very pure form uh, that is quite different from what they use in the stainless business. So I just you know, the nickel's got to come from somewhere and there are not enough projects in North America to feed the demand from the gigafactories that have already been announced. I agree, absolutely. Um, okay, just to summarize, what can we, what can you say investors will look out for in the coming months, the highlights? Well, you know, the big news is going to be uh, getting a new partner in. And we got a lot of interest from uh, car companies, uh, battery companies and major mining companies. Um, and we're talking to a lot of people right now. Um, they were all waiting for this PFS. And mm-hmm. I don't think they've been disappointed. Um, I think they can feel they understand the project better now. And we've got a great partner in Mitsubishi. Uh, uh, Mitsubishi, Mits- Mitsubishi likes to have, at the end of the day, 20 to 25% of a mine. They don't want to operate. They want to be a minority interest holder in the mine, uh, but they get involved at the development stage and they've done it successfully a bunch of times um, and they help to get the mine built. And they they have a lot of financial depth, as I'm sure you're aware. So it, it reduces the cost of capital, uh, you know, and they uh, are introducing us to a lot of different companies. So... Uh, just stay tuned. It's deal time. Um, that's that's going to be the next big announcement. I wish I could tell you exactly when. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been great to catch up, and it certainly sounds like an exciting time for Giga. And we'll catch yep. up again when some more news flows out. Katie, it's been a pleasure.